Good afternoon uh, and welcome to Dear and Friends. I'm Ju Hyun Jo, a program director of this Today Discussive program. I'm a curator and researcher based in Seoul and the founder of interdisciplinary curatorial research platform Drifting Curriculum. So yesterday we had an incredible time and engaged in meaningful discussions at the uh, ocean space. And I want to thank everyone who participated in the first session. And following on from yesterday, we have more exciting presentations and discussion scheduled for today. So the theme of today's session is post-Anthropocene institutions is another world possible. So we will contextualize and expand on the various social and ecological practices and debates present in regional biennales. So to introduce today's session and give us an overview of the program, I would like to introduce Jade Kunhe Lim, uh, director of the Art Court Center, who has overseen the 30th anniversary special exhibition of Korean Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, Every Island Is. So please join me in welcoming Director Jade Kunherim. Good afternoon. I'm Jade Kunherim from the Art Court Center in Seoul. Nice to meet you here in this beautiful medieval building and the garden of Palazzo di Malta. We opened the exhibition a month ago under the title of Every Island is a Mountain, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Korean Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. For ARCO, as the operator and commissioner for, of the Korean Pavilion, anniversary exhibition and this two-day discourse program is the first time we meet our audience outside the Giardini. And we thought it was an excellent chance to explore outside the national territories and with people from far and near to share knowledge and insights about what art and art institutions can and should do in this challenging time known as Anthropocene. I'm so pleased to host this uh, unique program, Ocean Friend, and co-organized with a drifting curriculum led by Dr. Cho ji Hyun and collaboration with the TV21 Academy. Thank you very much for your hard work and this fantastic event. I hope today's discussion continues to inspire and enlighten everyone uh, involved in this program and join us. Thank you for your participation and enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you for a great overview and introduction, Jade. And in this session, we will explore the potential biennales and art institutions to become proactive agents in preserving and transforming the world through decolonial curatorial practices. So I'm thrilled to welcome Colin Sterling and Elena Rora Sovrani and Juasia Krisha and Lee Pirote and Vera May together with Jade Kennedy to today's program. So before we begin with the main lectures, I'm honored to introduce a remarkable video work. It is a short film titled Elephant in the Room, created by designers and narrated by Donna Haraway. Hi, everyone. Very nice to be here. Nice to be in the shade as well. So the talk I'm going to give today, I'm going to read from a script because the, the issue of time is very important to my talk. And so I want to try and keep to time. And obviously, as you've just seen, time is also central to that, to the uh, film that we just watched. It kind of ends on this question of how much time do we have? How much time has already passed? Where do we go? How do we negotiate different ideas of time in this particular moment? And I just wanted to thank you for the invitation to speak at this really interesting event and very intimate gathering. As Julian says, my research is really concerned with museums and the environment, broadly understood. And I'm interested both in how museums have been entangled with many of the forces that have kind of brought us to the brink of ecological collapse. So you've heard about them just now, colonialism, capitalism, industrial modernity, consumerism, the division of nature and culture. But also I'm interested in, w in kind of what new museological imaginaries might emerge in a post-Anthropocene 
or post-fossil fuel world. And so to this end, my work combines historical analysis, critical theory, and speculative imaginaries, which included the Reimagining Museums for Climate Action competition, which was mentioned just now. And all of these make their way into this talk in some form. And as I say, we've just seen a, an example of the, of the latter, which I will speak about a little bit at the end. But today I wanted to start somewhere a bit different than usual. I have never actually spoken on what I'm going to mention right now before, so this is the first time I'm giving this talk. And what I want to talk about is that in an era that both kind of defines the Anthropocene in some way, so I want to talk about a time that both defines the Anthropocene, but also exposes the challenges of thinking about time, history, and environmental change through the lens of the Anthropocene. So using it both as a point of departure, but also as something to critique. And I want to start in 1947 with this image. So the doomsday clock is, I think, a very familiar marker of existential crisis to many people. And each year, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists announces how close humans are to destroying the world with, in their words, dangerous technologies of their own making. What you're seeing here is the first version of the clock, designed by artist Martel Langsdorf in 1947. And Langsdorf sketched the design of the clock on the back of a bound copy of Beethoven's piano sonatas and chose the time of seven minutes to midnight because, in her words, it seemed the right time on the page, it suited my eye. There was no rationale to it being seven minutes to midnight in 1947. Of course, in this moment, the greatest danger facing humanity was widely perceived to be nuclear weapons, which the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, as you might expect, took a particular interest in. But from 2007 onwards, the group responsible for deciding where to place the hands of the clock has considered catastrophic disruptions from climate change alongside other existential threats. So they consider a lot more things now when setting the hand of the clock. So today, in 2024, the clock stands at just 90 seconds to midnight, the closest to global catastrophe it has ever been. The hands were moved forward in 2023 because of the war in Ukraine, but also because of what they see as a continued lack of multilateral collaboration to address climate change and growing threats from disease outbreaks and disruptive technologies, including artificial intelligence. So obviously the, the clock, this clock, is a very blunt instrument in terms of its messaging, but much like the Anthropocene, it contains multiple stories within its simple design and framing. So in 1947, when the clock first appeared, the world was obviously exiting years of conflict, and the Biennale was planning its first edition since 1942. Under a banner of peace and reconciliation, but also under a growing shadow of nuclear apocalypse, the 1948 Biennale exhibited some of Europe's greatest artists. Interestingly, when I was doing research for this talk, the Venice timeline says that it was the world's greatest artists. But I think the list of names here will tell you that it was not the world, it was Europe. Max Ernst, Dali, Kandinsky, Miro, Mondrian, Monet, Cezanne, Degas, Gauguin, and Vincent van Gogh all featured in this uh, Biennale. I'm going to jump around in time a lot in this talk, just to warn you. I'm going backwards and forwards. I'm rejecting linearity, even as I'm talking about linear time. So in 2020, another group of scientists chose to mark time in a very different way, picking the bottom of Crawford Lake in, uh, in Ontario as the golden spike to mark the start of a new proposed geological epoch, the Anthropocene. I don't have to go into what that means, I think, in this context, but I just want to remind people that within geology, a golden spike is an ideal marker showing where one epoch ends and another begins, and that's what you're seeing in these images here. Typically, this beginning, this kind of beginning and ending is traced to major global events such as a mass extinction or climatic shift. Such events are generally visible in the form of layered evidence like changing fossils in rock deposited over time. And this site, Crawford Lake, was chosen as the site of the Anthropocene Golden Spike because of its highly unusual dimensions. It is just 300 meters across the lake, but 24 meters deep. 
which is really, really strange. This means that the bottom of the lake is completely isolated from the rest of the planet, except for what gently sinks to the bottom and accumulates in sediment. And this sediment preserves atmospheric memory in different ways, marking environmental change at a local and a planetary level. For the scientists charged with designating the start of the Anthropocene, this unique record provides a clear marker of the global environmental impact of one substance in particular, the radioactive plutonium used in nuclear weapons from the 1940s onwards. And for this reason, they chose this time and this place as the proposed start of the Anthropocene. As many of you will be aware, this proposal was rejected in March of this year, making news around the world. So officially, according to the geologists, we are still in the Holocene, although the scientists who rejected the idea of the Anthropocene did not dismiss the profound impact that humans have had on the planet, only the idea that this might qualify as an entirely new epoch. For many in the geological community, however, searching for a golden spike or a, state or a start date more generally was always the wrong question to ask. Time and geology are not so straightforward, these dissenting voices would claim, and linearity is part of the very problem. An alternative view of the Anthropocene, one that has gained traction since it was rejected as an epoch earlier this year, is to consider it as an ongoing, intensifying, diachronous event. Diachronous here, I should say, means that something occurs in different geological periods, so it's not isolated to a single period. The word event here is related to a geological definition of event, and events in geology are disruptive, rapid, and unusual occurrences that may fundamental, fundamentally alter the planetary system. And they are considered events because they are short, in geological terms at least, lasting perhaps a few thousand or tens of thousands of years. One such event that I'll just mention, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, which was 56 million years ago, lasted around 5,000 years, during which time around 5,000 gigatons of carbon entered the Earth's atmosphere, warming the planet by five to eight degrees and causing mega floods and storms globally, which has been seen as a really worrying history lesson for our current predicament. To think of the Anthropocene as an event is to recognize the speed and abnormality of recent, in geological terms at least, environmental change. Not least the level of carbon in the atmosphere, which offers its own unmistakable temporal marker of human impact on the Earth system. Crucially, however, this conceptualization should not be seen as diminishing the idea of the Anthropocene. As Matt Edgeworth puts it in a recent article, the emergent and intensifying Anthropocene event is world-shattering, world-altering, and world-establishing. Events, in short, can change things. They can set things in a new direction, they can bring whole new worlds into being, and they can end worlds. And it is at this point that I want to acknowledge an enormous blind spot in the temporal frameworks that I have focused on so far, the doomsday clock and the Anthropocene. The clock, of course, imagines that the end of the world is ahead of us, and therefore that concerted action might help to avert global catastrophe. Placing the Anthropocene on the same timeline as the proposed start date of the 1950s would have done puts emphasis on the recent past and the near future, erasing centuries of colonial and anti-capitalist violence from Anthropocene narratives. As TJ Demos puts it in a critique of the rhetoric surrounding climate emergency, it's as if the disaster hasn't already occurred in past invasions, slaveries, genocides, all perpetuated on ongoing land grabs, displacements and extractivism, as the traditions of the oppressed have ceaselessly shown. Of course, others have highlighted exactly these histories when proposing alternative Anthropocene timelines. Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin, for example, have argued that the decimation of the Americas following European colonization represents a better marker of the Anthropocene, bringing together global e exploration, colonialism, and the beginnings of capitalism in a way that, as they say, highlights how people treat the environment and how people treat each other. Note here, you can see in the image, that it is carbon levels that again determine this Anthropocene temporality, with a visible dip 
in carbon around 1610, known as the Orbis Spike, put forward as the start date of this Anthropocene event. Orbis is Latin for world, and the Orbis Spike marks when the Columbian exchange between Europe and the Americas can be seen in geological sediments. Much of the drop, as these scientists claim, occurred because Europeans carried smallpox and other diseases to the Americas for the first time, leading to the deaths of more than 50 million people in just a few decades. Whichever way we measure the Anthropocene, and whatever name we give it, and here I have obviously not addressed the problems with the name name, but these are important. I wanted to focus on something a bit different today. And whatever category it is placed in, epoch, eon, event, or something else entirely, I wholeheartedly agree with Donna Haraway, the narrator of the film you've just seen, when she states that our task now, the task of the present, is to make the Anthropocene as short, thin as possible, and to cultivate with each other in every way imaginable e epochs to come that can replenish refuge. So as blunt and simplistic as the clock is, and as much as it erases centuries of colonial and capitalist violence, the fact that it now stands at just 90 seconds to midnight is a grim reminder that we are still, I think, very, very far from achieving this goal. Interestingly, the furthest the clock has ever been from midnight aligns with the event that we are here to celebrate today, the anniversary of the Korea Pavilion. In 1991, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved the clock from 10 to 17 minutes to midnight to acknowledge the end of the Cold War. As they stated at the time, the clock is in a new region because we feel the world has entered a new era. It's in the early 90s. The present move was not easily agreed upon. Board members initially expressed divergent views, but on balance, a consensus was reached, reflecting a conviction that the world was changing in fundamental and positive ways in the early 90s. As is well known, Nam June Paik won the Golden Lion around this time in 1993, and in a letter to the mayor of Venice, he argued for the creation of a national pavilion that could bridge political tensions between North and South Korea through art, a message which clearly resonated with the reunification of Germany and the collapse of the Soviet Union around the same time. In 1995, when the pavilion hosted its first exhibition, as I understand it, the doomsday clock was set to 14 minutes to midnight, reflecting diminished hopes for a significant reduction in nuclear weapons after the end of the Cold War. In the same year, just so that you're aware, average carbon levels in the atmosphere reached 360 parts per million, just about what is considered the just above, I should say, what is considered the safe level of 350 parts per million. Partly in response to these rising levels, 1995 also saw the first Conference of the Parties, or COP, for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So this is like a real moment of hope or some kind of optimism and faith in concerted global action. And yet, as this chart shows, as we track the carbon levels over the past 30 years, hope seems to dwindle. Today, atmospheric carbon sits at 421 parts per million, a 30-year increase that is almost twice as fast as the 30 years before the first COP. So the levels have gone up twice as fast in the past 30 years as in the 30 years before that. Just as the doomsday clock simplifies historical narratives and negates previous world-ending catastrophes, there is a risk, of course, in reducing climate action and ecological justice to a number like this. And yet the carbon ledger also does something useful, indexing the relentless march of ruinous environmental change against the backdrop of so many social, cultural, and political events aimed at stopping this rise. So by now you're probably wondering, when is this guy going to talk about museums, which is what I actually do and research? I've taken a very slow route to my core focus because I believe it is vitally important not to isolate cultural institutions and practices from scientific and socio-political developments and debates. And within my own work, I'm very committed to thinking of museums as ecologically embedded, just as much as they are socially or culturally embedded. This means paying attention to particular, more-than-human interdependencies as they unfold in space and time. 
But the question is, what time are we talking about and what space? Individual museums will have specific ecological relationalities, but the museum world, I want to say, points to something bigger, to a set of planetary relationalities that are sometimes hard to grasp. My argument then, if I, that I'm trying to make here, is that we can begin to understand the build-up of carbon, the centuries of violence of colonialism, the failures of the post-Cold War, Cold War liberal order, and the emergence and spread of museums around the world as events within an event, as somehow all contributing to the same event, the Anthropocene event. The point then is that the end of this event, the Anthropocene event, this material and discursive episode that we are all caught in, no matter how little we contributed to it, cannot come soon enough. Or, to put it another way, what if the image of the doomsday clock is wrong? What if the bombs already exploded 500 years ago? What if they kept exploding, kept obliterating worlds? What if the speeding up of time associated with modernity and the great acceleration was really a hugely distended second in the aftermath of a cataclysmic event? This would require a very different sense of time and subjectivity. As Catherine Yusuf puts it, Thinking of the Anthropocene as a set of material practices of duration and arrival that brought this world into being launches a call for a very different kind of world making. The Biennale also marks time, of course, in different ways. Since 1895, it has acted as a measure of the art world or as an index of where things stand and where they might be heading. And while recent editions have certainly highlighted climate change and environmental breakdown as core concerns, the lesson of the Anthropocene event is that every Biennale has been an Anthropocene Biennale contributing in implicit and explicit ways to the material practices of duration and arrival that brought our world, this world, into being. Crucially, we could say the same about museums. What you see here is an image of all of the museums in the world according to Wikipedia. And there are now something like 95,000 museums across the world. If we were to go with the golden spike of 1950 and say that only those museums built after this point are Anthropocene museums, this would deny the fact that many of these institutions contributed to and document precisely the forms of violence that brought the Anthropocene world into being. We might suggest instead that museums are durational events that catalogue and mark the broader Anthropocene event. Since their inauguration in the 16th century, museums have documented, divided, sorted, organised, interpreted and exhibited the world back onto itself. But they are not mirrors. Rather, they produce and sustain worlds marking out some things as worthy of protecting and saving, and others as less valuable, less sacred. In this sense, they also destroy worlds. Their orbit of care and attention only ever extends so far. And as they have spread over the past five centuries, this is a map of when each country or each region got its first museum, first across Europe, then from the 19th century onwards across the world, so museums have been part of a planetary colonization that has imposed particular strategies for knowing and imagining the world onto highly distinct peoples and territories. The Anthropocene is typically visualized through images of pollution, waste, forest clearances and the like, but I think we also need to recognize that this is an Anthropocene image. The global spread of museums and the great exhibitions and biennales and other cultural institutions and events cannot be disentangled from the big event of the Anthropocene, the unfolding catastrophe that marks the past, present and future in ways we are only beginning to understand. Here I want to note that what I'm not arguing for is, that, or is to see the whole planet itself as a museum, or indeed that it should be viewed in this way. As architectural practice OMA demonstrated in their Chrono Chaos exhibition, which I think was shown at Venice in 2012, I saw it in London around the same time, a significant portion of the world is now designated as a conservation or preservation zone. Something like 12% of land surface in their estimation. It's probably more today. Extending this to 100% of the planet would not solve the problem I am talking about here. In fact, it would simply expand and prolong the anthropocenic logic that I am critiquing. 
And here I'm reminded of another Venice episode, the trio of articles written by Nika Dubrovsky and David Graeber in 2019 and 2020, which began as a critique of the Biennale and ended with a call to basically abolish the art world as it currently stands. Notably, in the third part of their extended essay, so in part three here, they begin with a quote from Russian cosmist philosopher Nikolai Fedorov and conclude with the following statement. Everyone deserves the same care and attention that we direct towards monuments and masterpieces and should for all eternity. How then can museums and cultural events aspire to this aim? How can they extend their orbits of care and attention to, to things other than specific objects or artworks? How can new events take us beyond the Anthropocene event, beyond the constant reiteration of the same in the name of difference? My reading of Dubrovsky and Graeber leads me to a troubling conclusion. Ending the Anthropocene event means something more than just creating new events or thinking that the next event might finally shift the dial far enough no, ending the Anthropocene event means recognizing that all these events are part of the same structure, which means working towards an abolitionist framework of change. And we see this, I think, in the film that we have just watched together. The American Museum of Natural History in New York was founded in 1869, and it has been critiqued many times by many different people and now faces vocal calls for decolonization. And of course, it has hosted many events and exhibitions over the past 150 years. From the 1960s onwards, many of these address the environmental crisis. And the image you see in the uh, middle here is the construction of an exhibition called Can Man Survive? A huge immersive installation in the main entrance hall of the museum, which ran for two years from 1969 to 1971. The core argument that Design Earth put across in their film is that such exhibitions and reforms will never be enough. Their animation tells us no more events, no more do-overs, dismantle the structure, let the elephant roam free. Another temporal marker. One of my favorite museum exhibits as a child was this section of a tree, this is the one in the middle here, at the Natural History Museum in London. I used to go there every school holiday with my mum. And this, this tree maps historical events onto the tree's growth rings. The section, however, is from a giant sequoia felled in California in 1891, when the tree was 1,341 years old. Two sections were in fact cut for display at the time. One went to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, while the other went to London, where it arrived in 1893, just when plans for the first Venice Biennale were being discussed. While native peoples had lived in California and known about these trees for well over 6,000 years, European settlers did not venture into the high country where these trees can be found for centuries after their arrival. As a result, giant sequoias were not discovered by Europeans until the 1850s, which seems astonishing for such huge things. And when word of these giant trees reached the east coast of the US, the UK, and continental Europe, people simply did not believe that they existed. To prove their existence, in 1854, a huge tree called the Mother of the Forest was felled, its bark was stripped, and it was shipped to England, where it was put on display in the Great Exhibition. Others followed over the next decades, with this actually being one of the last to be felled and exported. In their museum afterlife, such natural cultural artifacts document the material and ideological practices that characterize the Anthropocene as an event. They are of time and yet out of time. Their growth has been stunted and their story radically anthropomorphized. The histories that you see in front of them, placed in front, speak of wars and conquests and political upheavals that would mean very, very little to the trees. And of course, their death and transport across continents speaks of colonial and capitalist networks stretching around the planet, realizing everything in their path. Perhaps then we need another temporal structure to understand how the Anthropocene event might finally come to a close. 
if, as I have suggested, catastrophe does not lie in the future, but rather happened in the past and may be read through the various museums and biennales that have sprung up since, then perhaps it is more accurate to imagine that we have been circling a black hole for the past 500 or 150 or 75 years, with time and space distended into unrecognizable forms. What kind of museum or art might help us traverse the event horizon of such a phenomena, or finally break free from its gravitational pull? But for now, let us go back to the doomsday clock and note that it is a very, very strange clock indeed. It does not tick, but waits to be moved. It does not move forwards, but also backwards. And it is not even a whole hour or a whole day. It is just 15 minutes, and I have already spoken for twice as long as this strange clock can accommodate, so I will end. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Eleonora. I work with uh, We Are Your Venice, and I'm mainly focusing on the artistic side of the activities of the NGO. I would start by introducing the NGO, and then I would focus on some of the activities uh, we are doing, uh, which are related to some more hidden but fundamental aspects and dimensions of the city of Venice. So, first of all, uh, I would say uh, We Are Here Venice is an independent non-profit uh, organization which is based in Venice uh, since 2015. It's, it works as an activist platform and reinforcing the reconnections uh, between stakeholders, the community, and also the best available source of uh, information and knowledge. I would start by also focusing on three different main areas of our work, uh, which are Venice's, we call them Venice's de Laguna, languages of value, and the exchange of knowledge. About Venice's de Laguna, it concerns the basic uh, premise that uh, the health of Venice is dependent on the health of the lagoon and vice versa, and we see them as two inseparable elements of a single system. And for almost two millennia, there have been various kinds of coexistence uh, and constant tension between the human intervention and the natural dynamics uh, within this uh, unique context context. From the 1960s, uh, a different scale of problems has afflicted the, the city and uh, the lagoon, of course, on a social, economic, uh, administrative, environmental level. And our mission is really to return the lagoon to the center of the considerations affecting the future of Venice as a living city. Uh, the regeneration of Venice and the lagoon as a wetland of fundamental importance also for mitigating climate climate change is in fact one of the priority strategies to ensure, ensure the quality of life of inhabitants and the future generations. And then also languages of value, the other area of work I was speaking, uh, we men I was mentioning, it's about to define the parameters for better understanding and transformations and trends in Venice. Uh, and this could be done through a continuous and consistent research process. Actually, Venice uh, with uh, its uh, specific specificities can be an inspiration for solutions and policies uh, to radically respond to social and environment challenges. Exchange of knowledge uh, is actually sharing information through workshop, lectures, uh, field work, uh, orienteering activities uh, is fundamental for us as well, not just to present our activities, but also to get some important and precious insights uh, on what we are doing and, of course, exchange them and also co Co plan, co create the next uh, steps. Um, many of our projects uh, are also the results of intense uh, fragmentation and uh, aim to make visible what is often hidden and fundamental for the city, for the lagoon, and, and is, uh, its inhabitants, as I, I said. And uh, I, at this point, I would like to introduce you some of the projects uh, we work on also in the past. Um, for example, also Piazza San Marco is the most popular uh, area in Venice, some daily dynamics of the activities around the area in, in case of high tide are almost unknown to most of the people passing across the, the, the square. 
Piazza San Marco, for example, is one of the lowest area of the city. And so flooding is happening very frequently, even with the mobile barrier, because they cannot be in function for tight situation under a certain level. And uh, in occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Acqua Grande in 1966, we explored the ongoing uh, difficult relationship with water levels uh, among the businesses around Piazza San Marco. And uh, we also collected uh, and presented the experience Experiences, uh, images uh, and material through a multi-site exhibition in the area. We also drawn a waterline on businesses uh, windows of the piazza indicating the level reached at the time and also to spot the different location of the multi-site exhibition. Among the other things, we collected documents uh, about uh, different type of raised uh, walkway, like a uh, duckboard system in a different businesses location, or waterproof barriers, or also raised level cases. You can see two double spreads from the publication that we wrote about this. this issue and when you can see also some uh, water signs uh, so sometimes water levels uh, are recorded and sometimes water level just leave traces on the facades for example and those we trace and we photograph those monitoring uh, stations which are also very precious for the Venice uh, monitoring and forecasting system in the framework of this project, uh, we also collaborated with the Tide Forecast and Warning Center here in Venice. And their job is, of course, to monitor water levels in order to predict flooding and improve the techniques of prediction of water level data is, of course, uh, crucial for this. Uh, at the time, they had informed us, for example, that one of the, the tide gauge had stopped providing very useful information. It was just fall down into the water. And so it was really missing an important spot uh, because uh, monitoring stations are not just fundamental for monitoring water, weather conditions, but also because they can tell ambulances, for example, if they can take some routes under their bridges or there is no space for them. So during the 2017 Art Finale, we were asked by the Korean Pavilion and the curator Lee Dayang how, how it would have been possible to counterbalance their benefit for exhibiting in Venice, also in light with the theme of the exhibition at the time that was entitled the counterbalance the stone and the mountain. Uh, we suggested the installation of the new tide gauge. So with a 10,000 euro collected uh, at the Korean pavilion via spontaneous donations uh, by the visitors, We Are Real Venice could supply the materials together with the design for a new platform, overseeing its installation, which you can still find if you come along Misericordia in Kijo. Uh, so in that case, really, uh, the Art Council Korea pioneered a new form of engagement with the host city of the Biennale and ad addressing a critical aspect of daily, li of daily life, uh, which was facilitated by an NGO like We Are Venice. As we know, uh, the Ven Di Venezia is a global uh, cultural event uh, and a significant mechanism within the metabolism of contemporary Venice. Uh, and it has grown considerably since its inception in 1895. Uh, However, while the Biennale might draw the world case uh, to Venice, uh, it is of vital importance to investigate this serves the interest of the city and its residents. Exhibitors and visitors clearly benefit uh, from the extraordinary backdrop, of course, during the openings is special, then. but the serious uh, treats to both its, its historic urban fabric and future as a living city tend to remain uh, in the shadows. Uh, this is a report called uh, How Was It For You? It was provoked uh, by the Free Space team of the architecture in 2018. It was formulated as a response to the increasing awareness of the disconnect between the Biennale and Venice. And uh, the intention was to examine the growing relationship between the institution and the city and, where possible, analyze both the positive and negative aspects. So 
among one of the main critical issues uh, regarding the future of Venice as a living city, there is the problem of over-tourism, which is strictly connected uh, to the population phenomenon in Venice. This is an image from Venice in 2020, where it was particularly evident the fact that there are not so many residents in Venice because all the windows just stayed closed for a while. Inhabitants as we know, are essential for the survival of the city, but in Venice, the numbers are constantly declining, also because of the difficulty in finding uh, affordable housing. The experiences of residents are interwined uh, with uh, complex factors such as tourism, tourism pressure on the housing market, the student population, and the housing policies of public institutions. And so in, in the 50s, Venice had a population of about 175,000 of, pe of people, while nowadays residents are less of 50,000. It is, of course, a matter of proportion. For example, in 2019, the number of pets for tourists exceeded the number of pets for residents. This could all happen because because there is no regulation for short-term touristic rents and for booking platform online like Airbnb. This is a report uh, called uh, World City Is It Anyway, written in 2020, and presents some recommendations to support the city transition to a sustainable uh, equilibrium. And you can find it complete on our website. In particular, we focused on the housing issue with a project of ours, which is called uh, Solo Transitori, which was in collaboration with OCHO, Independent Civic Observatory on Housing and Residency, based in Venice. And with this project, we connected uh, personal experiences uh, to data and analysis about the search and rent of apartment in Venice, mainly starting from uh, looking uh, for a place messaging on the street of the city, but also from the online platforms. Uh, we collected, first of all, documentation on, on public and affordable housing projects that have never been built or finalized or that lie abandoned due like lack of maintenance, like these different projects uh, in the districts of, of the city. So the aim of this campaign uh, is to spread information about the housing issue in Venice to help create pres pressure and encourage political participation, which is what is needed to change the actual situation. For doing so, we use the municipal posting uh, channels, but also podcasts, and uh, there is also a dedicated web site, which is the solo, so transitory called, which solo transitory is the definition of the contract for just short-term rents. You can find more easily than long-term rents here in Venice. And in the meanwhile, also Alsat Alta Tensione Habitativa has started an initiative, a group of people, movement and organization, which operates especially with the purpose of getting a regulation for the short-term rents in Venice on a national level. So, and the problem is the population loss mirrors the scale of salt marsh disappearance. In fact, the extent of the marsh and the salt marshes in the Lagoon of Venice is just now one sixth of the total area that used to be one century ago. So the lagoon has lost its inherent functional role in attenuating water levels. So this is a very big loss since the Venetian lagoon ecosystem incorporates multiple activities crucial to life. Each of these uh, contributes significantly to mitigate it some of the anthropic processes, including climate change, uh, that threaten Venice itself. So this Ecosystem, these ecosystem services uh, include, for, exel for example, uh, absorption of considerable quantities of CO2 by the seagrasses on the salt marshes, attenuation of the tidal currents uh, coming so the from the sea, sediments retention and water purification, uh, and fish productivity, and so on and so forth. So the survival of this uh, environment has been ensured over the centuries by planned human intervention because the lagune is the result of the encounter between the salty water of the Adriatic Sea, uh, the Adriatic and the river of the Venice Plain. It's balanced, uh, it's uh, naturally precarious, and the vital 
Activities, which is the name of this initiative that since the 2020 we are working as We Are at Venice with other partners, among them also the University of Padua Engineer Department. These vital activities are really part of a tradition of intervention which aim at restoring the optimal dynamic processes of the lagoon ecosystem. From 2021, We Are Venice is also partner of Waterland, one of the project to be founded by the, the, the first project to be founded by the European New Green Deal, which aims to demonstrate and promote scalable solutions to wetland regeneration across different and wider geographical areas, starting with the six uh, action place spots that have been selected, including the Venice Lagoon. Developed in the frame, framework of this Waterland project, the Giants of the Lagoon is a participatory experience that invites the exploration of the lagoon environment in a movement towards the observed subject. So from the observation of the landscape to uh, the use of binoculars, uh, for example, to the observation of the even smallest uh, details uh, and elements uh, that you can see with the magnifying glass. This is just a suggestion to emphasize the value of each individual uh, element in relation to all the others. And in, this is an holistic view that could invite you to a continuous uh, change of, of perspective. And also it could be useful to know and take care of what it's, it's around you. So the pilot project called Giants of the Lagoon was developed last year with the Wageningen University in the Netherlands, Environment Department Department and the Natural History, Natural History Museum of Venice. And uh, it involved, uh, for the first edition, six, six classes from three schools uh, from the greater Venice uh, area, 11 or 12 years old. Uh. While this year the program has been broader and involved uh, 13 secondary school classes, so all in all uh, we had almost uh, 300 uh, students. So we basically, the, with the aim of safeguarding Venice and its lagoon as a living environmental, social and cultural system, we think that young generation are the most precious, precious resources for the future and uh, raising awareness among them is for us and for everybody, I guess, a, a priority. Thank you. Thanks for uh, this wonderful introduction and thanks for the invitation, Yushan Korean Arts Center, Korean Arts Council and ARCO. It's a real pleasure to be here and to participate in this event to reflect on the role of art institutions in addressing and indeed contributing to, as we heard today, some of the most pressing global challenges from climate change to social justice to other pressing issues. So today, in this presentation, I would like to draw attention to the second edition of Helsinki Biennial, already mentioned, that took place in the summer 2023, as a starting point to reflect or to explore the possibility of a more sustainable approach to biennial making. And ultimately, somewhat utopian goal, but to begin to try and reimagine biennials, biennial model beyond existing paradigm. So first, I would like to provide some background, briefly introducing some key principles behind Foundation of Helsinki Biennial. It's a very young event. It's only in the second edition, established in 2000. Some conceptual ideas guiding 2023 edition before moving on to highlighting some of the curatorial strategies in response to the global challenges and the specificity of local context. And I emphasize local context as it is, it played a really important part in thinking behind Helsinki Biennial. So, of course, this is not new. We've heard today in presentations already, and we know that artists and institutions have embraced the topic of climate change and other important topics for decades. So we don't need to remind them, with museums and galleries often exploring this theme in their artworks and exhibition programs. However, the reality of devising and implementing actions to mitigate the imprint that the world biennials inevitably leave is much more complicated. And again, we've heard today from two wonderful talks 
how complicated that might be. So with this backdrop, Helsinki Biennial was established in 2020. The first edition took place in 2021, interrupted initially by the pandemic, and it was founded by a visionary museum director, and I really want to play the pay tribute today to director Maya Taninen Matia, at the time director of Helsinki Art Museum, which is home to Helsinki Biennial and which produces each edition. And the funding mission was to embed commitment to ecological and social responsibility and sustainable processes in everyday working practices. A mission very much aligned with the city of Helsinki cultural strategy and the pledge and their pledge to become carbon neutral by 2035. Effectively, this laying foundations for new thinking of ecologically conscious and responsible arts programming. So Helsinki Biennial takes place on an island, one of over 328 islands in Helsinki archipelago. It's a former military island, currently uninhabited, with very unique protected biodiversity and architectural heritage. So placing Biennial inherently production-heavy events with large number of usually large artworks, mostly outdoors, and with the mission to attract large number of international or local visitors to such protecting setting is not without an ecological imprint. Alongside ecological consideration, it was also important to consider social context. And it's complicated, like in most of places, especially in relation between especially in relation to Finland's BIPOC minorities, black, indigenous and people of color, as reflected, for instance, in the ongoing conflict between Finnish state and indigenous communities, communities of Sami people. And it's also reflected in cultural structures, representation, access to cultural resources in Finland. So there are all these considerations going on while thinking about making Helsinki biennial. So how does the second edition respond to this context and contradictions, local needs and wider global conditions? Taking inspiration from American Chinese anthropologist Anna Lovenhaupt Singh and her seminal book The Mushrooms at the End of the World on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins from 2015, as our conceptual guide, Biennial was conceived as an invitation to reflect on these local and global issues, environmental damage, social justice or injustice, as well as technological impact. It is probably worth reminding that Finland is kind of European Silicon Valley in relation to gaming industry. So technological impact, quite important to consider. Following Singh's poetic exploration of the relationship between human beings and the natural environment, and the damage of the capitalist world, we come through reading of Tsing to reconcile contamination as an inevitable fact of life, not just in terms of environment, but also human and non-human relations, and amid which we need to find new ways to sustain life on our fragile planet. Guided by Tsing's call to learn from the art of, I quote, noticing, Helsinki Biennial became an invitation to consider how small, otherwise invisible detail might prompt possibilities to act, to imagine different, differently, and to reconcile the impact of human intervention, environmental and technological damage. Acknowledging other people, animals, plants, environment, data, and other human and non-human entities around us as agencies, co-creators, and beneficiaries, as in Singh's own opera, film work, Golden Snail Opera, we sought to bring cultural, natural and technological worlds together to inspire reflection and action, organized around three main conceptual threads, contamination, regeneration and agency. They were not themes, but intersectional vectors through which practices convened without any need to settle on any precise direction or position. To quote Adela Lovrich, review of Helsinki Biennial 2023 in Berlin Altling, entitled Sustainable World Making at the Helsinki Biennial, I quote, Helsinki Biennial offered an alternative to the bigger, better, faster logic spawned by industrialism, or, as things put it, against the timeline of progress, and instead in explored how we might gather, how we work together, and how we can challenge destructive ideas of progress by collaborating and looking around, rather than rushing ahead with reckless abandon. And I really like this quote because I think it really sums up that edition of Biennial really well. So how does this translate on the practical level, one might ask? 
So now I would like to highlight a few examples of cultural, of curatorial strategies, practice, examples of practice guided by these ideas. So let's talk about site sensitivity. Helsinki Biennial took place in the summer of 2023, presenting 29 Finnish and international artists or artist groups, 15 new commissions, extensive, extensive public discursive program in physical and online locations, with the focus indeed on site and social sensitivity. I note even before the opening Stair World article headline said, Helsinki Biennial sets new precedents for ecological and social sensitivity. And I think it was a good guide for us to try to achieve that. Considering ecological imprint that Biennial might have on an island, and again, I emphasized it was, it is protected site with cultural heritage, with buildings, uh, heritage, and with biodiversity, protected biodiversity. So considering all of this, while addressing the invitation to make Biennial in such setting, the idea became to decenter actually Biennial from the island with less works, works on a smaller scale, develop with and for the island. So instead, the Biennial, the Biennial expanded into the lands, embedding works in the city, in institutions including embedded in institutions including Helsinki Art Museum, Library, Central Library Odi, in public realm, and outside of the center in the east and north of Helsinki, bringing Biennial to areas of greater cultural diversity, as well as all online, the harbor from which to embark to the island and an online platform. Another consideration beyond sites was the way was to think about how biennial is made, the process of making biennial, both on the curatorial and artistic level, to try and reflect diversities of voice, diversity of voices, narratives and agencies. And I emphasize both humans and non-humans. So from site sensitivity to social sensitivity. So collaboration. Biennials are not slow by nature. They are very fast-paced operations, yet developing and nurturing collaborations takes time. Against this, in developing 23 edition, the focus was on collaboration, on opening up spaces for including diverse voices, and that's very important from the local context perspective. So we have invited a number of art organizations, research institutions, collectives, and technological entities which we refer to as curatorial intelligences, with particular focus on local collaborations. So curatorial intelligences were Helsinki-based Museum of Impossible Forms, anti-racist, anti-colonial feminist organization, Vika at Alto Arts, Visual Cultures Curating and Contemporary Art Masters Program, students and staff at Alto University, and internationally TBA 21 Academy for its focus on, on bodies of water, oceans, and ecological approach, and Critical Environmental Data Research Group at University Denmark, as well as an AI entity. This was created by Digital Visual Studies Research Group at Max Planck University of Zurich with artist Jech van Song, with a specific mission to work on museum collection and bring it to the biennial program. In addition to this, we also worked really closely with Verodina. It's a design studio and yoga studio to bring visual elements into curatorial thinking. So this approach, just to sum up, I think, might be best described as perhaps clumsy term, but something around post-curatorial collective intelligence, a term that I draw from combining Basam El Baroni's suggestion of post-curatorial and Marcus Reinman of TBA21 idea of curatorial intelligence. Human and non-human voices and sensibilities as a way of framing a very intensely collaborative curatorial work behind Helsinki Biennial 23. So, with approach to site, since going back to approach to site, to site, and what I've already mentioned, the idea of making biennial with and for the island, I think that sums up the quote from News Artnet by Joe Lawson very well sums up our approach. Quoting a lot of press reviews because as a year passed from the Helsinki Biennial edition, we are reflecting and trying to process what's actually happened and what impact it has. And I think those quotes, article, press articles were really, really helpful in that. Perhaps more radical, 
are the ways in which the island's natural features and crude infrastructures have necessitated curatorial and artistic intervention. It proposes ways to adapt to the world rather than relentlessly contort and control our surroundings until they become blandly ideal conditions. In doing so, we are rewarded by the irresist irresistibly, irresistibly a wild and beautiful landscape that envelops the works rather than having to face yet another white wall. And I guess what that approach must be, might be a sum up in a term living minimal imprint, which is what was our guiding principle. So on the island, a trail of it, 13 artworks were positioned at various points around the island perimeter. Certain works were scattered in unmarked, unmarked locations to encourage gently the act of noticing weaving into landscape and its wartime buildings. On an artistic level, I would like to draw attention to few artworks or artist practices in terms of how they approach site. Lotta Petronella, Finnish maker, filmmaker, artist and curator based on the island of Ruissalo, co-founder of CAA Contemporary Art Archipelago, working with and on the island for islands for nearly 20 years. For Helsinki Biennial, she collaborated with Sami Talberg, an award-winning chef, food writer and foraging pioneer since 2005, and with Lau Nau, a composer and performer. And together, they created work called Materia, Materia Medica of Islands, a disciplinary artwork of healing, song, and ingestion, interacting with diverse inhabitants of Valisari Island for live events, performances, recordings, including recordings with moths on the island, making essence of plants, moths tarot, choir, and ingestion events, and also commemoration event for Ilma Lindgren, a very brave Finnish woman who fought for the right to roam free and forage. Another artist practice that I would like to draw attention is Argentinian artist Adrian Villarojas, who created a 15, a total of 15 mutant sculptures in the series The End of Imagination. This was created in dialogue with the environment and non-human inhabitants of the island. Each sculpture was a result of a complex 3D modeling software, which the artist called, calls Time Engine, allowing modeling worlds, which in turn model the sculptures, producing a series of intensely detailed virtual physical sculptures made from materials such as glass, resin, and other organic and artificial materials. The forms appear like living entities emerging from tree branches or from the ground, like infected roots placed around the island. Alma Heikila, Finnish artist based in Helsinki, developed work with and for the island entitled Co-Adapted Co With, an outdoor sculpture colored with dye infused with local plants and enveloped in a canvas structure. The dyes are infusions of plant species growing on the island and elsewhere in Helsinki, interacting with the natural environment, weather conditions, rainwater mixing with plant dyes dripping onto the plaster, changing the color of sculpture over the course of the summer. Dineo Sasha Bopape, South African artist, her work I Remember Mama, connects deeply with the earth working with collect collected locally soil, clay, and organic elements, branches, tree branches, remains of animals, and so on. This was a way to remember her grandmother's stories, but also expanding to all grandmothers, as well as the waters and the earth itself, which feeds nature, houses, and support us all. This work drew attention to the memory of the land and the power of people reparative acts to protect natural environments and all that is sacred. It was placed on the harbor just as you would set off on the short boat ride to the, to the island. Elsewhere, Sonia Linford, a Cameronian Finnish choreographer and the founding member of artistic director and artistic director of Urban APA, an interdisciplinary and counter-hegemonic arts community based in Helsinki, developed collaborative work entitled Common Move, centering questions around blackness and black body politics, representation and power structures in Finnish context. So the work, a social choreography or choreography of the community, 
was realized in collaboration with BIPOC artists in Helsinki, rooted in local conversations and, and urgencies, taking place a form of the occupying space in several unmarked and unannounced sites around central Helsinki. Another aspect in considering how we approach the site and thinking about technology was technological layering of the biennial. And again, I use a quote from Joe Lawson, Art New News Artnet, which again sums up this approach really well. Quote, perhaps counterintuitively, the integration of emerging technologies is what has allowed many works to feel endlessly expansive without overwhelming the local ecosystem while creating a layer, layered space for the biennial experience. So the works range from purely online works, for example, a Korean artist in song, to those blending physical and digital spaces. Keiken, Mina Henriksson and Ahmed Alnava, Sieg van Song, Daniel Brefway Schille, Slide Behind Me, and Susan Trister. However, and one might ask question about ecological impact of technologies. This is something where it is very often unacknowledged, but should be acknowledged. A lot of research has been done, and I, if my favorite is to quote an FT artist, Memo Atken, who estimates that one NFT artist's half a year NFT carbon cost is equivalent to driving a car 838,000 kilometers or boiling a kettle three and a half million times. A study released by MIT Technology Review found that training phase of artificial intelligence software using only a high performance graphic card has the same carbon footprint as flying across the United States. This footprint is even larger on more complex devices, such as those used to create works of art. This is a result of a high energy dependence of these programs, which is responsible for the release of greenhouse gases. In addition, computers and other devices used for storing AI information produce a lot of heat and need cooling. So that's a backdrop to our technological layering of the biennial. Just to draw attention to one work or highlight this work is Daniel, a London-based artist whose practice focuses on interweaving living experience with fiction to imaginatively retell stories of black trans people. The work for Helsinki Biennial entitled Thou Shall Not Assume created a new mythology for the, vi for the island with characters, life-size figure characters, physical sculptures placed on an island with background stories online and enacted the whole work enacted via a role playing performances, performance events with the artists. Some examples of other work using technology, some blending realities. And I would like to end on the, this work, Susan Trister, a London based pioneer of technological art, we might say, making actually prints and drawings with vast collection of prints and drawings. Her work, Techno-Shamanic Systems, New Cosmological Models for Survival, intends to disrupt colonialist expansionist ideas towards the rest of the universe. We know corporations attempt to colonize and extract resources are underway. So her watercolor paintings were installed in a wooden cabin on an island presenting microcosmic, non-colonialist, in artist words, plan for our survival on Earth, as well as alternative visions of our communal futures. This was accompanied by a new AR component instead of, of the video work, in which islands appear to flow high in the sky. To sum up, I would like to air, end where we started with a quote from Adela Lovrich, Berlin Artling, and in a way, in response to previous talks where we discussed the idea of how art institutions biennial might or might not make difference. So I quote, even though sustainable exhibition making might not make a crucial difference compared to major polluters and extractors, what holds paramount importance in art nowadays are new perspectives and models of behavior that can influence our future co coexistence. And I would like to end here. Thank you. Hello, Vera. Hi, Philippe. Thank you very much for your precious time to join us today. It's a great pleasure to introduce the two of our artistic directors of the 2024 Busan Biennale to the audience of the exhibition 
Every island is a mountain. We are eager to hear from Vera and Philip about their project for Busan and their future vision for Arctic Biennales in this conversation. Uh, let me briefly introduce the Busan Biennale. It's been one of the most significant art events in South Korea since the year 2000. And this year's edition will open very soon on August 16th in Busan. And Busan is a beautiful city, the second largest city in South Korea, located on the southern tip of the Korean peninsula. And the city's rich cultural tradition, history, and coastal landscape are the source of inspiration for the Biennale's artistic directors. And this continues to be the case for Philip and Vera. The theme of the 2024 Biennale is Seeing in the Dark. And can you provide the details about the theme and its variations behind it? Sure. So it's called Seeing in the Dark, which, as you might notice, seems like a bit of a paradox. So, for example, it's impossible to see in the dark. Mm -hmm. But really, we were quite inspired by this idea, arriving at it through two main reference points. The first one is through the idea of um, pirate enlightenment, mm -hmm. as articulated by the anarchist anthropologist David Graeber, who basically rewrites a history of the Western Enlightenment through the idea of pirate colonies in the um, east coast of Africa, and Madagascar in particular. But we really see this as a metaphor for understanding histories of communalism, democracy, earned elected leadership through the kind of, I guess, metaphor of pirates. The other visual reference point um, and metaphorical and conceptual point for us is through the idea of Buddhist enlightenment. As a lot of, I think, you know, people familiar with Buddhism will understand is the kind of uh, spiritual and intellectual ascendancy towards this idea of enlightenment to another realm of being, but also kind of thinking. So bearing in mind this idea of enlightenment, we were interested in how that might translate or be engaged with in a context in Busan, but also this idea of um, seeing in the dark as a way to think about alternative enlightenment movements beyond the Western European one that we've become accustomed to. Yeah, and I think it's important to also both have ways the path of the pirate or the path of following the buddha is leaving yourself behind your former self so it's kind of like a very interesting engagement with direction to go which is not kind of like reduced to your former identity i think that's a very interesting metaphor for also the artistic path and seeing in the dark how does it connect to these two? Of course, it's kind of like it seems an opposite to the idea of enlightenment, but we solidarize with ways of thinking that are diasporic, which are archipelagic, which are of those people that are not necessarily recognized, those kind of groups or communities that are not necessarily recognized for their contribution to the dominant ways of thinking. And so it's a criticism, an implicit criticism to the demand for transparency. Thank you very much for your explanation about the concept of a pirate enlightenment and Buddhist enlightenment and explain how they relate to each other in your curatorial proposal for Biennale 2024. And with this curatorial concept, do you propose to reimagine the Biennale as a place of a kind of utopian community? Not really. I think it's a Biennale is too short in production to kind of like really do something um, structurally. But I think it's it's representing, in that sense, you, you use the word utopic. I don't really believe in utopia, but, but I'm rather thinking that um, what the Biennale can do is represent and show another way of living, not mm -hmm. necessarily coming the other way of living it's still art in our project so in that sense it's kind of like it's a representation of mm -hmm. other ways of organization other ways of being in the world uh, navigating in the dark as a positive thing rather than a negative mm -hmm. thing etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah you already mentioned alternative way you know in the past decade there has been a shift in the art world toward a kind of a non-hierarchical and decentralized governance and structures in Biennale organizations and cool curatorships. And for example, Castle Documenta 15 in 2022, curated by Round Group. I think it was an excellent example of an alternative approach to exploring boundaries uh, and the role of art. And uh, what kind of curatorial experiment are you trying for the upcoming Busan Biennale? Well, I guess, you know, obviously working together is really exciting. We've worked together on projects before, but I think maybe it's also indicative of a particular 
cultural and political climate where actually it's better to work with um, friends and colleagues and people you trust essentially. Obviously, we were very inspired by the work of our, our friends and colleagues um, from Murang Rupa at Documenta. And, you know, I think what they achieved is incredible. Unfortunately, like I mentioned, we don't necessarily have the runtime to do a structural mm -hmm. change of an organization, which is, is needed, would be, yeah. is kind of impossible. But we're trying to take on, I guess, different elements of exhibition design and use that as a metaphor for thinking through how art can be transformative in a kind of sensorial way. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are elements that we're playing with um, in terms of seeing in the dark that are literal, I guess, engagements with physical darkness and maybe, you know, how to navigate that through the body as a way of also a metaphor for maybe political change or political, you know, different understandings of societal structures. I think what you say is very idealistic. I think Documenta was the one and only unique example where this thing that you mentioned, non-hierarchical uh, organization, etc., was attempted and partly succeeded. I think most of the other biennales are still in a very rigid structure. Mm. Originally, they weren't. I think there is a, we have to rewrite that history too. It's like the longer a biennale exists, the more the, let's say, formal logistics are put in place and the least experiment is possible. I think it's kind of like the, there is a luck um, that happened to Documenta is that, in fact, the administration over all these years was very lean and very mm -hmm. small. Now, sadly, probably it's going to change too. So it's also over with that idea. So Rangrupa was a one-off mm -hmm. and a very important one, a very inspirational one for many people. But I think the effects will take very long before they come into place. Yeah. When we were looking at the history of biennials and the way that they have spread throughout the world and, you know, been really important, particularly in Asia, as a space of doing things either in the absence of institutions like museums and civic galleries, or they respond to a particular need in a place to be experimental, temporary. So, you know, for us, it was quite interesting to think about how actually biennials were first made or, you know, initiated because mm -hmm. there was a demand to um, to go outside of the, you know, of the museum structure. Mm -hmm. But obviously, I think the way that biennales have matured means that they mean something different now. Yes. So. Okay, thank you. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of skepticism about you know, large events like uh, biennales, and there were concerns from you know, artists and curators about waste management and long distance travel because of the carbon emissions. However, mm -hmm. the Venice Biennale um, 2022 took place during the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And amazingly, the number of visitors was over, do you know, the number 800,000 yeah is amazing which is a 35% increase compared to the previous edition before the pandemic so i think this proves that people's interest in art and willingness to travel for the international biennale remains strong even during mm. you know challenging times so moving forward you know, it raises the question of how biennales can stay relevant in the current era known as Anthropocene. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is really interesting because COVID in some ways acclimatized us to be more online and digital. But I think the experience of being with art or seeing art still demands a kind of, and with people, still demands a kind of stubbornly analog presence. Like there's something about how people want to, see something for themselves, not a simulation of, of that thing. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, what COVID did was heighten our need to be in physical proximity mm -hmm. to art and others and to people and communities. So in terms of Biennale saying relevant, I mean, I think that's an ongoing <laughs> question, but I, I still think, you know, their potential as an alternative space, creative practice, of artistic engagement, of community and world building, but also of experimentation, it's still needed. You know, we still need mm. a platform which does something different mm. to the kind of status quo understanding of what art is. There are a lot of biennales which try and kind of fail and maybe our biennale might be part of that, but I think it's still worth um, giving an energy and a commitment to 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 seeing or to trying to make an alternative. Yeah, I think they are very needed, but they are also under threat. I mean, they yeah. will continue to exist, but they are eroded by, in fact, market-driven uh, concerns. And I think that's where the Biennale as a discursive platform that kind of like sets the tone in discussions about 
art, and I don't mean that exhaustively, but just like specific discussions that can be tackled during a Biennale is under major yeah, threat of, uh, of other interests. Uh, you feel that the public money for Biennales withdraws and the Biennales are forced to kind of find other solutions to uh, finance themselves, meaning you get the content is driven by the money more and more. Um, and it's kind of almost impossible to feature content that is not necessarily backed by a country or a gallery yeah. and and i think that's a very very enormous challenge that if we want to continue biennales as a relevant art uh, event then i think we have to fight against this erosion yeah i think we should be maybe least worried about the relevance of biennales and more worried about the dominance of the art fear as a model yeah. that seems to sort of camouflage as a biennial event yeah certainly in venice that's very clear yeah. thank you very much for sharing your perspective on this issue and my last question is about sustainability yeah it's related to the third question sustainability is one of the most discussed topics in art institutions like museums and biennales and it's uh, encouraging for me to see that uh, Biennale curators and artists are conscious of uh, ecological and social sustainability and trying to decolonize art ecology by being more democratic, communitarian, and also environmental. And many organizations are mandated to create sustainability policies. However, in my opinion, artistic and curatorial imagination is more crucial in art than just conforming to institutional frameworks. So in this context, I'd like to hear about how you envision the sustainable future of Art Biennale, particularly the Venice Biennale and its uh, national pavilions where this conversation originated. I think what we've noticed is a shift in a lot of biennales to have national pavilions, mm -hmm. um, I mean, beyond Venice, to kind of model you know, themselves after Venice and having national pavilions. And my personal perspective is that that's not a sustainable way to, to as a biennale to kind of model an old archaic structure obviously the question of sustainability and the climate emergency is you know something we're very concerned with on a day-to-day -day level and I think it's really sometimes it's for us about making small changes so like in terms of who can travel giving opportunity to people who don't normally travel like an artist who might not be on the biennial circuit and hasn't traveled a lot maybe it's like giving them an opportunity to also th see things so that it's not just the same people circulating. I mean, right down to that kind of, I guess, granular level mm -hmm. of understanding the relationship between movement and equality and how that might fit into a configuration of the planet and mm -hmm. the climate is also really important for us. So it's not just this kind of like big picture, oh, we should stop traveling, but it's like, mm -hmm. okay, actually who often gets to travel and who doesn't? And how can we sort of intervene with those processes of selection a little bit? Yeah, I think it's it, there is also a, a double bind in there. On the one hand, you need international encounter in person. It's really not good to do everything over Zooms. and uh, So you need to also meet people. I mean, the, the politics of the world would change in the wrong direction if people are not al allowed to meet each other anymore internationally. So mm -hmm. I think priorities in climate have to be set different. It's probably less, less a priority for businessmen to travel and mm. to meet you know like it's, it's just about logistics you yeah. can you can exchange that over if it's about travel and 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 that type of uh, sustainability i think more for the rest the art world is is quite conscious about it and and of course has to has to find ways it's it's ex in an experimental phase i think it's we didn't want to thematize climate because i think it's a little bit hypocritical to kind of like jump on that discussion which is kind of like an urgent discussion of course but what can the art world do we are in certain places um, on the tip of no return in climate which mm. is the art world is not going to change anything to that it's a way bigger we chose for a smaller thematic because I think it's preposterous for art biennales to kind of like attack these like global importance thematic. We're all entangled in, in many different ways. So it's kind of almost impossible to be consequent. And I think <laughs> when that demand comes, 
we are going to kind of like shoot ourselves in the foot. And, and, you know, part of the reason why we're interested in pirate communities and Buddhist communities is traditionally they're communities of humility and resourcefulness. Yeah. So they work with what they have. There's a kind of humbleness and accessibility of materials and things and goods. It's not about necessarily exploitation. The pirate traditionally is not adding new products to the world. It's just redistributing existing about, ones. Yeah. So, and, you know, Buddhism is about abandoning a certain material attachment, mm -hmm. which I think particularly in our sort of contemporary consumer stage is like very relevant. Thank you very much for your time and insight and this conversation about the sustainable future of the art Biennale was very productive and inspiring and we're going to continue discussing the topic further with the other panelists and the audience in Venice. And Vera, Philippe, and I wish you a joyful journey to the Biennale in August. So thank you, Jade, for leading that inspiring conversation. So summarizing today's lecture and talks, it seems the direction for biennales and art institutions in the era of climate crisis involves finding ways to challenge destructive ideas about progress thoughtfully and collaboratively rather than rushing forward recklessly. So we need to explore methods that encourage cooperation and reflection. So now for our final segment today, we will have panel discussion with our distinguished guest here with us. Please welcome Colin Sterling, Yuasia Krisha, and Eleonora Sovrani and Jade Kunerim. And first, I'd like to direct my question to Professor Colin Sterling. Over the past few years, I've introduced your project Reimagining Museums for Climate Action in Korea, finding opportunities for this movement to continue the Korean art scene through education, publishing, and exhibition, and so on. But this project uh, represents grassroots movement where small-scale art organizations collaborate on artistic practices to create different kinds of work. As, and as you have observed, this project involves extensive collaboration between art institutions and various groups of experts and communities. It is challenging for large institutions like museums or biennales to engage in long-term collaborations with experts and communities from various fields to successfully influence public policy or community actions. What strategies do you think are necessary for these larger and international art institutions to foster such long-term impactful collaborations? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think there's there's a bit of a kind of tension or paradox in what's happening around museums and sustainability and climate action at the moment, in that many of the most vocal institutions working in that field in that space are actually the biggest institutions. They're the ones with the money, they're the ones that are visible, they're the ones that when they announce something, it, it is headline news, right? So 2019, Natural History Museum announced a climate emergency. Mm -hmm. It was headline news certainly across the UK. I, d I don't know if it reached further afield. I think uh, Tate Modern, Tate, Tate Britain, you know, they've all done, they've all made big announcements. The VNA, I'm just speaking from my own context here, of course. Mm -hmm. And then also in the Netherlands, the Rijksmuseum, the Siedlik, they've all made big announcements about their ambitions to address climate change and sustainability and to basically do things differently and to work differently. These are also the spaces that are kind of the most targeted and the most critiqued of all the institutions, both in terms of decolonization and in terms of fossil fuel sponsorship. So you have this really strange paradox going on at the moment with big institutions in particular, where they are saying all the right things and then also becoming sites of protest and climate action around the world. And that has probably become more and more visible to more public audiences in relation to the kind of just stop oil protests of throwing things at Monet's and, and stuff like that, which I think is a bit separate, but is also obviously connected because now the public sees museums and galleries as spaces of protest in relation 
relation to climate. And I think that those kind of protests are a bit of an unhelpful distraction, I have to say, from, from the most serious targets that we should have for climate action. I fundamentally don't understand why throwing potato at a Monet is going to help climate, is going to address climate change. But I think what that kind of paradox and that tension also exposes is that maybe we just shouldn't be looking at these places to save us anymore. Maybe we just should not be worrying so much what the British Museum is doing to make itself carbon neutral by 20, 2030, whilst also refusing to return any objects of any meaning <laughs> to communities. It's like those debates are just going to keep going round in circles and it's going to push forward in some ways and then people are going to push against it and this is why the reimagining museums for climate action projects i found so exciting because yeah we had just 250 submissions from people in 48 countries around the world who were just radically saying no okay we value some aspects of what museums are doing we think you know questions of care and and uh, repair should be really vital and museums do do that in some ways but they also don't do it in others so you know what entirely new formats might we imagine for this thing and I'd, I encourage my students to do this in class a lot we kind of start with the big institutions but then immediately I try to decenter big spaces in these debates yeah thank you Eleonora Nora, you are an artist in researcher and activist working with an NGO in Venice and you have led actually various independent art projects so based on your experiences leading initiative and project at U we are here Venice that have successfully influenced public policy and community action towards sustainability and what were the limitations you faced and what strategies were crucial to your success yeah thanks for the question yeah so as a collective and NGO we are always uh, challenged by the question of how it needs to be done filling a gap or react uh, directly to negative occurrences so I would say that the issue of time is uh, still very important for us and of course a lot of our activities requires a, a lot of time because as I mentioned also before they are the result of intense frequentation and concentration and attention. I like the metaphor uh, that recalls uh, this way of working on cartography like in the old times when there was no big picture depicting the reality but uh, cartography was made by really navigating the lagoon by boat so really this is yeah great things but on the other side of course requires a lot a lot of time which is also the time that the regenerative process regarding the lagoon ecosystem would require and as well the time that a regenerative process with the community our strategy and it's really uh, trying to make this distance between action and research and research uh, smaller and, and smaller and we this is an aim a mission but doing this working on this process of course the community and the stakeholders and the, also the institutions are part active part in it like co-creating the, the plans about our our activities in, in general and i have to say that also having to deal with institutions sometimes of course uh, require or also public fundings like in in the case of the waterlands project and other projects all the projects in the end it it is required again a lot of time and also adapting to other partners on the other hand there is a huge part of bureaucracy that has also to be done and sometimes this is in contrast with the contingency of our grassroots and active work in venice Interesting. And this question is for USIA. And Biennales are in inherently short lived events. So, do you have a vision for how Biennales can catalyze 
long-term social change in the Biennale? And what specific strategies are you using to make this happen? Thanks for the question. I have some experience of biennials, but I make no claim for universal knowledge of biennials. I'm only speaking from my very, very small experience here. Yes, that's right. Biennials are inherently short-lived events, but so are other exhibitions. They are all temporal events, maybe except for, I don't know, permanent collections in museums that stay forever or close to forever. But, but biennials, as ex exhibition format, they are temporal events. So in that sense, they are no different than any other formats, exhibition formats. However, why I'm interested and in what's different about biennial format is that they very often or can be situated in particular locality and in that sense relevant and important interventions. And again, we here and I really take a guide from my colleagues discussing this. We're talking about big global scale irresolvable challenges yet we are part of it, and at the same time, we have very small, limited possibilities of acting. But these small acts, they together somehow push things together. And I think that's what's interesting, and that's why I've been somehow interested from the start, working with biennials. My first ever curatorial experience were, was working with media art biennial called WRO, WRO in Poland, and then Documenta, his biennial, and Liverpool biennial, especially Liverpool biennial, a very interesting history, very situated locally, and working with various communities. I won't go into detail of context, it's another story, but, you know, the, the sort of local situation, but it's a very, very, it became a very important vehicle to address and draw attention to some really pressing issues locally. So I think this idea of being in locality, in a particular place, in a particular context, and forming relations, this is what is interesting for me. And again, we've heard, of course, there's always very little time, there's always not enough time to form relations, to form collaborations, to try to intervene with things. And I also, you know, don't take this attitude that we arrive somewhere and we necessarily have to change things. But it's interesting to form relations and think about what can become. And again, sometimes biennial as institutions continue from addition to addition. Sometimes they don't, so these things disappear. I think what was interesting for me in Helsinki Biennial is to kind of align myself with institution when the biennial was established. So I was part of initial discussion, discussion about establishing biennial and taking direction, and then being invited to curate the second edition was this opportunity to build. And I think, again, I, I sort of pay tribute to Maya Taninen, who is, who is now retired, but she had this vision of this biennial being the sort of vehicle for change. Finland is a small country, a small art scene. Things don't change that fast. You need external factors to maybe initiate some change. And that was her thinking that through this and through taking a more sustainable approach, so working longer term with people in different roles might actually lead to something. So shifting structures, working, thinking, rethinking, working processes, relation, that's what I find interesting. But again, you know, the issue of how do we keep memory of these changes? I mean, it stays obviously in locality with people. But thinking about Helsinki Biennial, I realize there's a lot of things that did change. I worry that the website will disappear because they do after each biennial until the next edition comes. We actually started a website registered as New Directions May Emerge, trying to think, imagine of building a platform that can be more longer term expanded and bring other people beyond this biennial edition to invite to think about sustainability sort of more collectively. Mm -hmm. So watch the space, it might come at some point. If you're asking me about strategy, that's one of them. Thank you for inspiring comments. So continuing this to the public art institutions, I would like to direct my question to Jade. So what changes do you think art institutions especially public art museums or a center, need to make to prepare for the post-Anthropocene era. So in particular, could you tell us about any project you already trying or planning at the Art Arts Center? Yesterday, we learned about you know, islands in Asia-Pacific region suffering from climate changes and artificial disasters. We also discussed that learning from locals and respecting their unique culture is crucial for 
preserving lives of their islands and the planet. I was deeply moved and delighted by all these thoughtful arguments because you know, they are closely related to aims of our curatorial programs. For example, we have presented solo shows of artists Hong Yi Hyun Suk and Song Jae Cha. Our curatorship focused on the, their viewpoints and attitude regarding the relationship with uh, human and non-human beings as well as local and global. And Hong, Hong Yi Hyun Suk performed the ritual of reciting the Buddhist prayer for sick creatures on the verge of extinction. And it was a very unique and powerful experience. The participants constantly recite the name, creatures' names until they reach the uh, state of trance. And what she tried to do in this performance was invite the participants to feel closer and empathize with the non-human being by being the creatures themselves. And Jung Dae Cho, who passed away before the social, collected marine garbage in Jeju Island and made a map of their origins. Surprisingly, the garbage found in the seashore was not only from the island, but also from the China, North Korea, and many distant places. And his beautifully drawn map showed how the ocean connected different parts of the world beyond the national and artificial borders. Mm -hmm. He proposed the oceanic thinking as an alternative worldview in this project. We also curated many thematic exhibitions focusing on learning from non-human beings, such as mushrooms and fungi, as et cetera, et cetera, all different ways of living. And we also worked with local artists and activists focusing on their engagement with local communities by learning their cultures and traditions. I can talk about this, you know, day and night, but this is only a tiny part of our endeavor for sustainable future. So what can art institutions like ARCO do in challenging times called Anthropocene? Institutions have a inertia in their own ways that makes them change very slowly. However, as I mentioned in the previous interview with Vera and Philip, I believe what is more important is for us is the vision of the future and imagination of the alternative mode of life by artists and curators beyond the institutional framework. And this is also the spirit of Dear Ocean Friends. <laughs> Good, thank you. And my last question is for all uh, panelists today. So what do you envision for the future of Biennales? So, Jyotia, would you like to go first? Thank you for the privilege. What a question. It's a very important question, but it's a huge question. I think uh, maybe without attempting to kind of move the whole mountain, just a very tiny, more modest biennials, more embedded, gentler, and thinking, you know, about working practices. I didn't mention this in my talk, but behind Helsinki Biennial, there is a whole set of thinking about working processes on the level of waste management, to materials, to recycling, to employing coordinator that works on those issues. And it was greatest wish of Maya to see all art institutions having uh, environmental coordinators. Uh, so maybe that's my mm. sort of take on this. Thank you. And other, other speakers, would you like to respond to this? Yeah. yeah, also, of, of course, I agree about all this. Actually, I'm, I think that artists and creators uh, could contribute a lot in enlarging the knowledge about the environment uh, we are living in. But, of course, I think uh, that a structural change is, is needed and uh, it's uh, possible. Uh, also, the institution should, of course, uh, work in this direction also very, very practically, starting from thinking, having all the regulation, I don't know, I, it's also, I think that it would be also nice to work with limits uh, for an artist, uh, again, it could be very playful, <laughs> so also having some limits uh, in thinking about the afterlife of the installation, the pieces of, of work, of art, and because as we really know, since uh, we are also based in Venice and we see the amount of waste when the Biennale is finishing cannot uh, be possible, speaking about sustainability. So this is really a priority, as well as a priority thinking about not rush moment of the opening or rush moment of installation for the artists. I think that it would be better to push the artists, the collective, the creators to really have even stronger a relation and connection with the city, even staying a longer 
time here even thinking about working on the installations from here and not just delivering those from the other part of the world. Project could be not just every year changing the project, but I know there are also some biennials that are engaging with some very long-term projects that every year, for example, are presented in pieces and also in the doing and not just the final work to, to, to present at the Biennale. Maybe it could be also very less uh, stressful for everybody. <laughs> and I think, yes, we, we can change things. We have to change things. So I wouldn't say Biennale should just be a metaphor to, for creativity and to make how it would be possible to, enlight, to go for another enlightenment. But really, since uh, it's very powerful as an institution and also everybody has a big power in, in that, we can really think to, to change things. And also, from the Biennale side, uh, it would be very interesting and fruitful to think about the use of the spaces of the Biennale when the Biennale is not there. Because, yeah, residents in Venice are few, but there are. <laughs> and uh, sometimes uh, they have to go outside to find the workshop places to work. And so if we want to really push to, to another kind of economy, which is not just related and dependent on tourism, giving space is what the first thing in terms of housing and in terms of uh, working spaces for people, for craft craftsmen, for students, for residents and artists. Yeah. Thank you. Very important comment. Colleen, would you like to comment on this? Well, I just think that those are all excellent suggestions. <laughs> and I feel a bit underqualified, really, to talk <laughs> about the future of biennials, mainly because this is only the second one I've ever been to. I came to Venice in October last year to celebrate my 40th birthday, and that was the first time I'd ever been to a biennial, uh, the, the architecture one, obviously, last year. And mainly, they've just not really been in my world through a certain subjectivity, and you're not introduced to the art world until you're much older. They're not part of your world. And I think that's true for many, many people. And so we need to recognize that they are extremely divorced from the, re the realities of many, many people's lives and to start from that position. But what I've been inspired by today, that's a bit of a negative <laughs> reading, but what I've been inspired by today is like how many, what, what's happening really addresses multiple forms of embeddedness art should be doing in the world is about inspiring or modeling or prefiguring potential worlds and forms of change and what I often miss and what my students ask me for a lot is like when has this give me an example then mm -hmm. give me an example of when this has ever happened when has when has art changed stuff and I would really like to know if there is already an archive of change that has happened because of bi biennials mm -hmm. or whatever. And if not, I would like to create one. Very the future good. could be archival, <laughs> actually, looking back on what they've actually done. Yeah, thank you. And Jade, I actually gave you a very special <laughs> privilege to you. <laughs> and last answer, would you like to respond? Yeah. I mean, I will answer your question very briefly and very mm -hmm. simply. Mm -hmm. I see the future of the Biennale as a platform for learning from each other rather than you know, competing each other. Sure. Thank you so much for your enthusiastic responses. And now we will take a couple of questions from the floor. I have a comment to the Biennale. The Gwangju Biennale, when it inaugurated, I think it was created also having inspiration from document, which was founded to reconnect post-World War Germany, which was very isolated back to the world of art and culture. We had degenerated art, etc. And it was a will to basically reconnect and maybe it's very selfish. Guangzhou, as I recall, has been created as a commemoration to also the resilience of artists, particularly the wood carving artists, etc., in Korea, in, in Guangzhou. And it was to commemorate the people died in the civic uprising in, in this city, which is more of a working class city. And the first Biennale, if I recall correctly, has been visited by about one or two million people. And it's everyday people. And I see the same in when we did Istanbul Biennale last year in a very difficult, two years ago, in a very difficult situation in Turkey. And we had 600,000 people visiting. I see the Sao Paulo Biennale visiting by almost two million people. These are not an elite. It's a school classes. It's everybody. But these Biennales, and I don't know with Guangzhou now, but Istanbul and Sao Paulo are for free. So I think what became very elitist, I have to say, is 
museums and also venues are very expensive for normal people. If you want to go with the family, you cannot put just down 100 euros in, in very difficult times for people. So I think it's really what we have to do is to be more advocates to make these exhibitions accessible. Because for many people, and I've worked with Biennale since almost 30 years, it's very often the first time they encounter a contemporary art exhibition. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are door openers. Yes, it's not for everybody. I mean, my family loves soccer. I prefer to go to Biennale. Mm -hmm. So not everything is for everybody. It, it's okay if people don't want to go. But if they want to go, they should hear about it. I agree with you. They should have access to it. And we have to create them in a way they are accessible to people. They don't feel alienated. And mm -hmm. I agree completely with you about the sustainability. On the last two biennales, I said, I don't want to see money going into dry mm -hmm. rock walls, dr uh, plaster walls, etc. Let's work with textiles. Let's create furniture. And afterwards, they even are reused or they can be picked up by everybody. And I know that the Venice Biennale also does it. I did three public and everything we had left over mm. we gave away from sofas to TVs to chairs and they were happily taken up by the community but many people don't know about it that there is this possibility I think there's a website for it so I think what you said it's a communication I think we really have to improve our communication thank you thank you so much Utes. very valuable comments and is there any other questions Hi, I think this question is more for Eleonora, but also for the other panelists. I think I hear and relate a lot about the time that if that you're investing in the younger generation that you see like as a precious resource, and also the different kind of art projects that inspire nuanced education and outreach for them. And all these kind of take time to blossom, even for the young minds to mature and also make some sense of the environment for themselves. And it's maybe a little personal, but what might be your take? And if you have felt at any point that the mature of this time, of their time, and the actual escalating time of the current social and environment issues are also escalating, is there a point in time that you feel they do not align anymore? If so, how do you reconnect and rejuvenate this hope for yourself and for your collective in the work that you do? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think it is quite well understood. Yes, I I have a lot of faith in uh, the new generation because actually we're just on this in general, but also practically because we are now with the second edition of this uh, one-year project with the schools uh, and we were all, all a bit wondering about the results or the attention of this kids with we who are really often attached to the phones and a little bit losing the connections with the environment and also because some of the schools are as i said located uh, not in the venice islands but in the greater venice area and also didn't see the lagoon before so it was a bit of a surprise in the end to see how they responded and, and how they were curious. Also because we planned, we developed this uh, project with a strong focus in uh, observing, also reflecting and taking a lot of time again in observing the, the environment. Uh, so yeah, it was a bit of a risk from one side because uh, we didn't know how they could have reacted. But then after a while, uh, the more they spent on the observation uh, the, the more they, they also could really see new details. Uh, we had an exhibition that just finished at the beginning of June with all the results of this uh, journey and re-elaborated drawings and uh, notes uh, they took during the whole experience. They really spent a lot of, of attention and uh, effort uh, in, in, in doing this. And, and and doing this, uh, and uh, they were really enthusiastic. So from my point of view and the point of view of the uh, We Are Venice, I think that uh, we still have some hope uh, on the new generations. And yeah, of course, uh, we have to do something anyway. So <laughs> thank you. So now the question that I have is, is this. So if you're going to think about all of this sort of temporal, spatial disorientation and anxiety in terms of here and now, how to re-anchor that, right? Perhaps something like a Venice, as an example, as we have these problems often of, of our art, you know, 
the concentration of wealth and capital and uh, you know sort of cooperation, all of this sort of you know, questions that are very much present in our conversations, like artists and art coming to, to Venice and then pack up and go, right? This is a problem they've been talking about, right? And so then, then how do we think about the evacuation of this, right? At after the event, perhaps we can think about this convergence in terms of like site sensitivity. What if actually Biennale really is about all these amazing artists coming to a particular site and really engaging the here and nowness of the event? I think this could be a very interesting way to subvert the energy, right? By using the structure they already have, all the way from, say, you know, small town Biennale, right? And, and a large scale international Biennale. There's a hierarchy and the divergences and all of that. But it's just occurred to me that just like by actually re anchoring here-ness and now-ness in, in this way, we can use the structure itself to, to, to re attend, as it were, to the, the needs of, of survival. It's like you, we have to live outlive and live on, right, from now on. And so it's just a kind of whether you have any thoughts about this sort of dynamic, because you're all in, in this sort of, you know, field, you know, this is your lifelong project. And, uh, and so some examples that we can think about how to re-engage the localities. And uh, one example there also from Korean mm -hmm. <laughs> Pavilion from 2017. It's an example in interacting with, we are here in Venice, right? I mean, we are here in Venice, so sort of how the artists coming in and really interacting with the local culture and, 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 and agent, agency, right? I mean, so as in ways that really cross-fertilize what's happening. And I just feel that there might be just one way, a direction that we can also try and concretely thinking about. So it's just partly a question, but also kind of a query, like uh, what, what could that be? Like how would we think about that flipping the script, as it were, right? Uh, to see what, what does it mean like for, 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 for artists to, to from all over the world going to Guangzhou, right? And to really learn about the civil uprising and then, you know, to really engage the question right there. It's sort of bringing the product into Guangzhou and unpack it and pack it and go. But there's all sorts of other layers of Venice that I think is really part of that Venice Biennale. And so maybe it's a question of really shifting our focus to, to really explore and rediscover that aspect. So that's a long-winded sort of comment, but also question and some invitation to think more about this locality here in Nowness of Biennale as a recursive event that doesn't cancel itself out in, in this sort of repetition structure. So thank you all for insightful and fascinating discussion today. And I'm very thanks our panelists for sharing so many inspirations over the past two days. And I also thank the audience for their attentive participation. And we, so now we conclude the two-day discursive program, The Ocean Friends. So once again, thank you all for your attentive listening.